here. So really quick, I'm going to go around the room. I want everybody to tell me their name so I know who you are. So I'm not just like you, you know, and I mean, hey, you, you know. I'm probably going to forget your name anyway. So we'll start here and we'll work our way around. Hi, I'm Michelle. Nice to meet you. I'm Abby. I'm Abby. I'm Matt. Brandy. I'm Paisley. Jody. Natalie. Jess. Yeah. 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 Okay. Nice to meet you guys. Um, really quick, we're going to just go over some ground rules just for your own safety. Um, please don't run at all on the property. There's uh, The ground is very uneven and a lot of the areas you'll be in, and it could also be wet as a lot of the areas leak and it's flooding, so I want you guys to slip or anything. Um, obviously, I have to say this, no drugs or alcohol. I'm sure none of you guys are drunk or high. Oh, so. darn. <laughs> well, no weapons. I don't think any of you guys have weapons. Um, we have an open door policy here, so if the door is open, that means you can go in. But if you need to parkour to get into an area, please don't go into that area. So if there is a door that's closed, a chain, a trash can, a chair, something blocking the doorway, don't go in there. I promise I'm not trying to hide anything from you guys, I'm just trying to hide like spills that are very sticky. And I'm talking like 50 year old fabric softener that's been sitting on the ground for God knows how long. Um, so I'm not trying to hide stuff from you. Some of the doors also aren't on the hinges and I don't want you guys to be pancaked, so please don't pull on any doors too hard. Um, don't summon anything, okay? No candles, none of that. No Ouija boards, no divot boxes. Now every single rule has a story, so the bathrooms inside don't work. So please don't use them. Please use the port potty inside. Um, Darn. Right, right. There you go, Brandy. You can't use the inside ones. We do have bats here. So if you see a bat, uh, please don't start screaming because then I'm going to get scared and think one of you guys like died. So please don't. Um, there are going to be a lot of dark areas you're in to make sure that you're lighting your footpath and don't shine your flashlights up because the bats will swoop you. Um, so keep them pointing down to your feet. Um, with that being said, it shouldn't be that big of a deal because it is the morning, so the bat shouldn't be out, but just in case. Uh, but with that, we can start our walking tour of this site, and we can talk about who was here, why this place existed, how long it's been around, and why it's so important historically. Um, so we're probably, talking about individuals who had intellectual and physical disabilities. So we're thinking autism, Down syndrome, MS, ADHD, ADD, cerebral palsy. Those were the individuals that were housed here. Now what we're standing on is a very small area of what once was here. When Penhurst was open at its peak in 1953, there were over a hundred buildings that made up this campus. What we are currently standing on is the lower campus, which is where the men were housed. And then the women were housed up on the upper campus, which is where the VA now stands. Um, on your way in, you guys probably passed something called the Spring Hollow Golf Course. You guys, you guys kind of saw that. Mm -hmm. That used to be a part of Penhurst. The Wild Wild used to be a part of Penhurst. How about that power plant uh, coming in? Yeah, the power plant. Is that Penhurst? That was also yeah. Penhurst. Penhurst was huge. Now, the reason why it was so big is because it was supposed to be completely self-sufficient. It was supposed to be its own standing society. Do we have an idea of why? Throw it out there. Throw it out there. I'm going to point at someone. Did they want people that didn't have disabilities to be coming in here? So that, and also they didn't want people who have disabilities to be a part of society. Right. Way back when, when we're talking the early 1900s, all the way up into the 80s and even 90s and even today, people don't, uh, people specifically back um, when Penners was open, they had a problem with people who had disabilities. They didn't want them to be a part of society because they were deemed unfit. They were deemed different. And Penhurst was very deeply rooted in the idea of eugenics. Have you guys ever heard of eugenics? No? Okay. A good example, not a good example, okay, but an example of eugenics would be World War II, the Holocaust. Have you guys heard about the Holocaust? That was an idea of eugenics, separating people from society who don't have desirable traits. So when Penhurst was open, they didn't understand that individuals with disabilities was genetic that regardless of, even if you do separate them from society, people will always have disability. And a lot of people actually in their lifetime they end up becoming disabled. Now, the whole idea of Penhurst was to separate individuals with a disability from society and to keep them away. And when Penhurst opened, it was meant for kids to rehabilitate 
and teach them so that way they could be part of society. But they actually never ended up making it back into society. Now, obviously, kids grow up, and after the first three years of Pennhurst opening, the wait list was already full. And then we were already facing issues of overcrowding. Five years after Pennhurst opened, we had our first abuse record. Now, the issues with Pennhurst really do stem from abuse. It stems from neglect. Pennhurst was a state-run institution. So the Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania the state ran this institution. And because of that, we ran into issues with overcrowding, lack of education, understaffing, um, and underfunding. We ran into so many issues. Now, there was a documentary filmed in the 1960s by a man named Bill Baldini. Have you guys seen it? No, the youngings probably haven't, but the adults have you seen it. Yeah. So it is a very, very graphic watch. Um, and in that documentary, they show the individuals here being chained and shackled to beds, being um, medically restrained, physically restrained, starving, sitting in their own fecal matter and urine. Um, and it's a very, very gruesome watch. So why was that okay? Why did that happen? Well, a lot of it was because society didn't know what was happening to the individuals here. And in fact, these individuals were deemed as not human. And they were deemed as potential criminals. And that is exact terminology that was said here. The individuals here, they didn't really have much to them. The state would fund everything for them. They didn't get to decide what they wore, what they ate, what they got to watch in the day room. There was none of that. Now, the state actually gave the animals at the Philadelphia Zoo more funding per day than a resident here. So how much do we want to say a resident had to their name a day? There's some numbers out there. Throw a dollar amount. Dollar amount, dollar amount, dollar amount. I'm going to point at someone. Three dollars. Three dollars. Fifty cents. 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 Yeah. Yeah. A resident here had less than 35 cents a day to feed them, to medicate them, to clothe them, to bathe them, to take care of them. The animals at the Philadelphia Zoo had over seven pounds a day. So animals are more important than actual living and living humans. Now, okay, well, we ran into the issue of lack of staffing, right? So when Pennhurst was open, to be generous, we'll take the Limerick Building, which is on my left over here in your guards' right. Now, the Limerick Building is a very dynamic building. So, and you'll notice that a lot of the buildings are very dynamic. So we'll take Limerick for example. Now let's say on the second floor, we had 75 residents, okay? Now we had 75 residents on the first floor as well. And that's being generous. That's on the lower number of things. We would get up to 125 per floor. How many nurses, how many nurse aides were taking care of them? Throw a number out. Three. Two. Two per floor. Per building, we were at two. Ooh. Wow. All right. And these were not nurses, these were nurse aides. Now, to become a nurse aide here at Pennhurst, you needed to graduate high school, and then you needed to take an IQ test. And that was it. That, that was literally it. To become a student care certified if you wanted, but that was it. Now, why did you need to take the IQ test? Well, the IQ test was to prove that you were not as dumb as the residents here. Now the residents here were divided up by three different names and three different sections, and that was based off of their IQ. So we had moron, imbecile, and idiot. That's how we divided them up. Wow. Now, if you were a moron, you would have an IQ between 20 to 25. If you were an imbecile, your IQ would go from 25 to right around 50. And then if you were an idiot, we were looking at that 50. Now, it was thought that the rehabilitation here, the IQ would actually improve. And it never did, it actually got worse. Um, and that was because a lot of the residents here didn't get to go to school. And in fact, they were actually put to work. Because we ran into that, that lack of staffing. Um, and Just as so you guys know, like an average IQ is around 100. Yes. Like 70 is not far from what everyday people are, to so you have an idea of where IQ stands. Sorry. No, you're okay. No worries. Um, and so we ran into the lack of staffing. Now the Limerick building is important again. I'm going to cover the Limerick building 
um, while we're standing here, and I'm also going to cover Avenue. Uh, so, the Limerick building housed uh, individuals on the second floor. However, the first floor was very interesting. So, the first floor they had what they had the uh, commissary. Now, these were uh, this was a place where the residents who worked they got to buy quality life goods, so candies, magazines, cigarettes, things of that nature. Um, they also had the visitation center on the first floor of Limerick. And the visitation center was open two days a week for about four hours each day. It was by appointment only. Um, and you can only really see your family member here for about 30 minutes. They never let the family members into their actual um, wards. So if someone lived in Mayflower or Devon, they weren't allowed. The family members were not allowed to go in there. They had to visit them in the visitation center. This was because they didn't want the family members to see the conditions that they were living in. So they would get them all dressed up nice, bathe them, feed them, happy, and then they would go in. Um, and the visitation center was very nice. It was the only place on the whole entire campus that had gardening. It had nice chandeliers, nice furniture, and you'll notice as we progress through, you'll notice the furniture here is kind of covered in this plastic wrapping. Um, but the furniture in the station center actually was cloth and had like soft padding on it. Um, and the reason why they had the plastic covering was just because it was easier to cover. Um, but that was in the visitation center. Now, when we talk about the commissary, okay, where, where were they getting this money, right? Well, they were being put to work. They were working in the laundry facility. They were taking care of other residents. They were working on the farms. They were making furniture. These were all the things that could happen. Now you would think that they would get paid in real money, right? But they didn't. They actually got paid in the full monopoly money, which was called the Penhurst Dollar. Wow. Now the Penhurst Dollar is literally a white bill. It has a picture of George Washington on one side and then the admin building on the other. And it has, it literally says Penhurst Dollar. Um, and that could be used in the Limerick building because you have to remember the residents here were not deemed as human, so they were paid in real money. That's just how it was. Now the administration building behind me, so this actually isn't the original administration building. When Penhurst first opened, the campus was very small um, and it consists of the Philadelphia building, the Tinicum Union and Vincennes buildings. Now, unfortunately, Union and Vincennes have come down Tinicum is still standing, and Philadelphia is still standing. Now, Philadelphia used to be the original administration building. Um, and this was the first place residents would come to get signed in, to get their paperwork done, to get their, their picture, their stamps done, of their handprints and their fingerprints, and then they were sent to a ward. Now, there were no residents ever housed in this building. However, um, there were uh, residents in this building, and there's very, very, very few buildings that residents weren't housed in. Penhurst was so overcrowded, we had residents living in barns all the way on the fields. Um, the Mayflower building is actually a residential ward. So the people lived in it. They lived on the first, second, and third floor, and then the basement was where therapies were done. Now the different therapies at Penhurst consist of music therapy, physical therapy, hydrotherapy, and at one point electric shock therapy. Well. Um, now on our first floor, we have residential. Second floor is also residential. Now you'll notice that in some of the buildings there are uh, dividers set up. Now those were actually put in the 1970s. Um, and for most of Penhurst history, it was just wide open rooms. And to put into perspective of how crowded Penhurst was, they would line the beds up so there was no space in between the beds. And then a resident could roll over into the next bed there was no space to get into them. And the reason why they did this was one, because they didn't have the space, but two, if a resident were to fall, they would have to do paperwork and then they couldn't take care of the resident. So instead, if they could just roll into the bed, they didn't have to do the paperwork and they could just roll them right back. Um, now, up on the third floor, we have what was housed, and they are known as the Bright Boys of Penhurst. That, that was literally the term that they used. Now, these were residents that their IQ was high enough that they could go to school. So, Penhurst here, in order to go to school, you needed to have a high enough IQ. There were very, very, very few that could actually reach that. To put in perspective, you guys all know who Stephen Hawking is, right? right if Stephen Hawking were to be put here, he would have had an IQ of three. And the reason being is because he couldn't write and he couldn't speak. And in order to take the IQ test, he would need to write and speak. So he would have an IQ of three. And Stephen Hawking was one of the most brilliant humans 
was one of those really big events. So up on our third floor, these individuals were deemed human enough to take care of themselves, to feed themselves, to bathe themselves, to have their own privacy. And when you go upstairs, you'll notice there's smaller rooms. There's one still community bathroom. Um, however, if a room has one closet, that means there was one resident in there. And if there were two closets, that means there were two residents in there. Now, you'll notice that Mayflower and Limerick are mirror images of each other. But Limerick and Mayflower have two separate layouts. They're not the same. And that's because the Mayflower building was actually caught on fire. And you'll notice that a lot of the buildings are not ADA compliant. So there's a lot of stairwells. There's not many ramps on the property. Um, Do you guys know what ADA stands for? What, what was that? What was that? Oh, oh okay. ADA? Yeah. yeah. The American with Disabilities Act? Yeah. Yes. So, back when Penrose was open, that wasn't a thing. There were no, um, there was nothing in the Constitution, there were no laws protecting individuals with disabilities. So the ADA, the Amer um, American Disability Act, none of that existed. None of it. So, that actually didn't exist. We'll actually get into that in, in a little bit, um, and why Penrose was a very big stepping stone into that. Um, and so what's amazing is that this fire, they didn't have any casualties, which I don't really believe, but okay. <laughs> um, because they had residents on the second floor, they had residents on the first floor. And how they combat this was, okay, well we have individuals who are crib bound, who are wheelchair bound. Um, and these residents, they all lived on the first floor. So on every single first floor, you can expect individuals who had mobility issues across the board. Um, yeah. Do we have any questions so far? No questions again, question. Who decided who was smart and who wasn't? So that was based off of the IQ test. Okay. Yeah. That was done on admission? Yes. Admitted? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, oh, that's a great, that's great. So in order to be admitted here at Penhurst, you couldn't just kind of show up um, and just be admitted. It was uh, usually done through doctor's recommendation or a court order. Um, in order to be admitted here, you need to do the IQ test and things of that nature um, and, and through that. Now, did that stop people from just being dropped off here? No, it did not. So there used to be a train that ran on the back side of the property. Um, and way back when, uh, parents who didn't want their kids, they would actually put their child on the train and put a name tag on them with just their first name so it couldn't be tracked back to them and petters. That is so sad. Wow. During the Great Depression, families would just leave their kids on the front steps here because it was better to have a roof over their head. Now, could residents here ever leave? Yeah, yeah, they could. Um, but they didn't tell them that. Um, and in order to leave, you actually had to take the IQ test again and score higher. But because there was no rehabilitation, there was no schooling, there was no, no therapies for most of the residents here, their IQ actually declined. So they couldn't really leave. Now, um, when Penhurst was open, you say, okay, well, well people, people could leave, they could sign themselves out if they could pass that IQ test, but did people escape? And absolutely they did. People did escape here. And were some of them successful? Yeah. And one of the cases I like talking about is actually of two gentlemen who worked in the industry building. Um, and they built a raft very, very slowly, so it wasn't obvious. Now, this land is like a peninsula. And the Spookal River runs on this side of the property here. And so they built a raft. They took that raft down to the Schuylkill River. And then they went upstream towards Reading. Upstream. And they were homeless for about a week. They got a job at a blacksmith shop. And then they got their own apartment together. Now these two were heavily disfigured. So obviously, because individuals with disabilities were separated from society, people were scared. They were like, what is wrong with this you know what I mean? Because they weren't used to seeing it. Um, and they're, one of the people in their apartment building calls up Reading Police Department and says, hey, my neighbors look weird. Okay. So then the Reading Police Department comes over, knocks on their door, and says, hey, Penhurst. Calls up Penhurst. Hey, Penhurst. Are you guys missing residents? Yes, we are. And then those residents were brought back here, and they ended up dying here. Mm. That's the shame. It is a shame. Like, they were just doing their own thing. Let them do their own thing. What happened to people when this place closed? That's a wonderful question. So, in 1987, Penhurst closed. Now, Penhurst had a 10-year relocation process, which is 
genuinely probably the best thing they've ever done. Um, they took 10 years to relocate every single resident that was living on campus at the time. Now, over Pennhurst history, there were 10,000, a little over 10,000 residents throughout the whole, what it was, it we opened 1908, we closed in 87, so that's 79 years open. And in that time, uh, we had over a little over 10,000 residents, and it's estimated that 5,500 of them died here. So in 1977, the federal government says, Pennhurst, you need to close down. And we'll get into why that happened later on. Um, and then, uh, so then Pennhurst was like, well, you can't just open the doors and let them go. Now in psychiatric institutions and other institutions, absolutely, they totally just open the doors and let them go. Um, uh, particularly with asylums, they would actually give the patients three months of their medication and just open the doors and say, good luck. Um, and so, in those 10 years, every single resident was either put back with family, put in a group home, and they were found some place to go. So they didn't just open the doors, they didn't just let them run free, they actually spent the time to relocate them. Now, over the 10 years that that took since the federal government, government said, Pennhurst, you need to close down, Pennhurst was fined every single day that it was open for those 10 years relocating the residents by the federal government. Which I think is like one of the best things Penners could have done. And they did do. Um, so do you have any other questions? No? Yeah. I know I'm throwing a lot of you guys. I'm gonna keep throwing.